How's it going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. Uh, excited to talk with a new guest. Uh, this is Peter Sue. He is a cannabis banking executive with over 20 years of experience in the industry. He's got lots of insights for us in the niche of banking. How are you doing today, Peter? Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me on. I I, I hope I won't let you down when you say I've got insights. <laughs> Oh, no, you got insights. I, 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 I've been stalking you, man. So I, I, I've already seen what you can do, knowledge you have. And so I'm excited to talk with you. Definitely Thank a valuable you. voice in this industry. Um, but really, I wanted to start off by talking about you personally. Can you tell me a little bit more about who you are, your background, your personal journey, who you are, that sort of thing? Sure, sure, sure. You know, I love talking about myself, as you know. <laughs> No, I, uh, you know, my story is fairly straightforward. I've been in banking, uh, I guess, 23, 24 years or so. Um, I've done a variety of things, uh, middle market, private banking. Um, and as you, you know, pointed out, <laughs> uh, I guess about six, seven years ago or so, I got an opportunity to start a cannabis banking program uh, here in New York. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, six years ago, seven years ago, like that, that was pretty early on in, in cannabis banking. Um so I, I've seen a lot sort of evolve over the years. Um, um, so, you know, cannabis banking, I guess, is kind of what I've become known for. But, but the reality is I've actually uh, done a variety of other things. And so cannabis banking is a relatively small piece of my overall resume. <laughs> yeah. And so I was, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile. And I discovered that you write for Rolling Stone. Can you talk about that? I do, yeah. <laughs> you know, I uh, and you're in media. You might appreciate this. Um, so again, I've done a variety of things. I've got a lot of certifications. I, you know, <laughs> again, you've been on my LinkedIn profile. I have I have seven uh, um, certifications that that actually, you know, um, designations they call it. We, you know, you add letters after your name, uh, but no one ever asks about any of that. <laughs> the first thing that people always ask me about is the Rolling Stone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're so big everybody knows them <laughs> it's like oh you're a certified treasury professional nobody cares but tell me about rolling stone <laughs> <laughs> um so yes as you pointed out i have a byline with rolling stone uh so i write about the cannabis industry for the rolling stone cannabis culture council yeah that's very cool um let's so let's put that aside as you said you want to talk about banking and understand that's the whole point of what we're doing here no, no, not at all. I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, if you're going to take five seconds, tell me about what you write about then. Oh, you know, honestly, I try to stay in my lane. Uh, I'm a banker, right? So I, I write about uh, banking, financing, uh, the business of cannabis sort of as, a, as an industry. Uh, I try to stay away from things that, you know, are very sort of product specific, um, I don't know, flavors and stuff like that. I, I don't usually talk about stuff like that. So again, it's more about uh, cannabis as an industry, the challenges within, you know, et cetera. Uh, occasionally I step out and, and, and write, I, I actually wrote an article about podcasting uh, as a tool for, for cannabis, which you might, you might find that interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's, let's jump into the bulk of the topic here. I'd love to talk about yeah. cannabis banking, what you do. Um, but first I'm really curious, uh, why, why did you jump into cannabis banking and not just any other dish? Oh, uh, actually, I'm glad you said niche because that's exactly what happened. Uh, I recognized early on in my career that uh, the people that I knew that did really well, um, they tended to specialize in something. They had a niche. Um, and actually, uh, I remember there was this gentleman, uh, the one person that I really saw put that into action. He specialized in something called EB5, EB5 banking. Um, he made so much money doing EB5. He was a specialist, right? But I'm talking like nationally recognized, like went in front of Congress, you know, et cetera. And he made so much money doing EB5 that the bank had to change its comp plan. The bank changed its comp plan because this one guy blew out the numbers so hard wow. that the next year they said, no, no, no we got we to gotta redo no, this. And naturally, my first thought was, um, my first thought was, what the hell is EB5? <laughs> so, um, so that was sort of my first foray into like, well, I need a thing. I need a specialty. Um, so, so to your point, when I got an opportunity, somebody said, you know, Pete, we're thinking about doing this uh, cannabis banking. I was like, well, yeah, that, I, I could do that. <laughs> well, let's jump into the elephant in the room here. You know, I, I worked with many different cannabis uh, professionals. And you know, one in particular was mentioning to me previously a couple months ago how he had his accounts blocked uh, from the, the bank. Um, so I'm really curious of how, how you navigate the regulations and all the other political noise to kind of avoid that sort of issue. 
Uh, well, you, you don't avoid it per se. I mean, uh, to your point about like, uh, you know, blocking and, and compliance and stuff like that. The reality is the, the answer is actually fairly simple. At the end of the day, if there's transparency, let's assume the bank is saying, hey, you know what? We, we get it. It's cannabis. There, there is a little bit of gray area, right? There's a discrepancy between federal and state law. But here in New York, you know, uh, it, it, it's legal. It is, it is a legal industry. Um, in fact, in 2018, uh, our uh, Department of Financial Services, so our state level banking regulator, actually put out a memo encouraging state charter banks to bank cannabis. So from the bank's perspective, hey, this is our regulator is saying, let's do this. Right? Um, so why does things like that happen? Well, it could be um, maybe the bank is half in, half out. You know, they're a little bit half pregnant. They're willing to do it, but they're very scared of certain things. That could be ignorance. It could be naivete. Um, it could be, and, and this is actually sort of interesting. If you, as a bank, if you went to your federal regulator, and I've done this multiple times, right? Um, and you ask them, hey, I, I, you know, you're, you're my uh, federal level contact. And I say, Sam, can I'm thinking about doing cannabis banking. You know, I seek your guidance or I seek your permission for that matter. Um, believe it or not, the, they won't say it's okay. Now they won't say it's not okay, <laughs> but they won't say that it's okay. Uh, so to your point, let's say, let's say I went to the Fed and I said, can a cannabis business do wires, which is, which is purely a Fed wire function, right? Literally it's called the Fed wire they won't say that it's okay. They also won't say it's not okay again. <laughs> so what do I do? Well, I had to make my own decisions and create my own uh, paradigm and framework of like, okay, here's what I'm willing to do. Here's what I'm not willing to do, et cetera, et cetera. So if someone gets blocked, you know, why? Because maybe the bank doesn't do cannabis banking, but they found out, uh, uh, let's, let's say your, your business, right? You've got, uh, You've got a podcast and you have the word cannabis in your podcast. Is that a cannabis business? Not really. <laughs> but the, the, uh, the grayness of it is what makes certain banks nervous, right? So, that, so to answer your question, you don't avoid it. The, the, the key is not to avoid it. The key is to take it on you know, head first and be transparent. No, and I'll have to share your response with him because maybe he's just working with the wrong people and should be talking to Peter soon. Yeah. <laughs> And so let's jump into your services. I'm actually kind of curious. Um, how do your services work? Um, do you offer consulting advice? Or do you offer banking? Are you also, uh, do you help with investment advice and sort of stuff, lending? What, what do you do? Oh, uh, well, so at this point, I'm back running a, uh, a cannabis program. This is my third cannabis banking program uh, here at Hanover. Um, so I ran two prior ones at, at, at big banks. Um, and uh, uh, for, for a bit there, I was a consultant, so I worked uh, with dozens of programs around the country. Uh, so when I say programs, I'm talking about a bank, a credit union, um, someone like that that's thinking about cannabis banking. Um, you know, they, that, that used to be my position where they would hire me as like a subject matter expert. Uh, but today I'm just a regular run of the mill banker running a program again. So, yeah, uh, my clients are cannabis businesses and or the, the principals, employees, et cetera. So, you know, what I wanted this time around, um, again, you know, third time at the third bite at the apple, if you will, I wanted a bank that was okay with this concept that I want to treat cannabis businesses like a normal business, right? So this is a little bit of what you were asking before about like, well, you know, why do certain things happen? Well, I didn't want those things to happen. I, I didn't want a cannabis business to be banking here. And we tell them like, okay, you can bank here but you can't do this or you can't do that or whatever. Now, to the extent possible, right? To the extent possible, because the reality is there are certain regulatory concerns, hurdles that we have to meet. Um, but what I am doing today is full service commercial banking. So anything a standard business would go to a bank for, we are making available. So yes, uh, it, it's depository services, wires, ACH. We are lending. I've done a, a, a this is a relatively new program um, for me anyway. Um, uh, so we've done a handful of lending deals too. So we are lending to cannabis. So I'm curious, um, say you have a cannabis operator, business owner approaches you, uh, they need help. Um, they're yeah. reaching out to you because they know that you know this banking stuff. 
how does the sales model work? How does it work? Do you, do you start by asking them or having a discovery call, figuring out their needs or what, what exactly is the process? Yeah, you know, uh, when you are, and fundamentally, I'm a salesperson, right? Like to your point, I'm, I'm trying to create this uh, this new business for the bank. Um, but as a salesperson in what is considered a high risk arena for, for the bank, um, it's sort of an interesting position because on the one hand, you got to grow the business. On the other hand, the bank has mandated, has tasked you with being super careful with who you are, we are onboarding. Um, so the sales funnel is both a sales funnel and an, call it an interview process. You know, I would sit down with you, say, oh, Sam, tell me more about your business. Uh, the key is, do I understand it? Do I understand your licensing? Uh, and thus have some idea of what your, how your business is going to run, what I should expect in terms of activities, things like that. And more importantly, kind of capturing that into, into some sort of a paper trail so that if your business starts to look very different than what I thought it was going to look like, that we somehow are alerted and I call you up and say, Sam, it's only change about your business, right? Um, so, so yeah, it, it's honestly it sounds like an interview, but that's what it is. It's really me sitting down with a person, just understanding their business, asking them a lot of questions. And then hopefully, you know, we're comfortable, we move forward and we, we help them grow their business. Yeah, awesome. I'm also curious about what you kind of see going forward, um, especially with the cannabis sector and the financial or cannabis niche in the financial sector. Uh, what trends do you kind of see in the next five years? Is it kind of improving, you know, with the 280E or the, the rescheduling? What do you think? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the evolution that I've seen in, in my re relatively short period of time here, um, meaning here in cannabis, <laughs> um, has been tremendous. I mean, I can tell you uh, in, my, in my early days when we first started, when I first started banking cannabis, we used to ask for... Um, essentially the entire licensing application licensing meaning the, the the application that they gave to the state to their state to uh -huh. get a cannabis license so let's say here in new york if you look at the early um you know ro's we call them right so the the first 10 cannabis licenses in new york some of those applications were like five thousand pages like it came in like a disc <laughs> like they used to they, they would mail me like a dvd right or a cd that i would have now ask yourself this, right? Who at the bank is reading the five thousand page application? I would imagine nobody. <laughs> um, if me. I read it, do I know what I'm looking for? You know, and how much of it is really applicable? You know, for for my purposes, right? So uh, if you've ever, I don't know if you, you know, for like dispensaries, with it, it used to be common to. Uh, go to the dispensary, take pictures of like, you know, with your camera placement, do you have a vault, do you have secured access? A lot of the things that like the state regulators were doing, the banks were doing too. So why were they doing that? God knows why, right? Like it's just, you know how it is, it's just paradigm changes over time. Um, so today you're really not seeing that anymore. Like 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 I said, my, my mission statement of saying, well, we want to treat cannabis businesses like normal businesses that's slowly happening. Um, so what do I see as a trend? Yeah, I mean, it's not just a trend, it's happening. You're starting to see banks and credit unions, traditional financial institutions, treating cannabis businesses like normal businesses. So that I do, I expect that to continue. Um, and in fact, it's gonna uh, significantly accelerate if we reschedule um, to schedule three. Uh, for the simple fact that free cash flow because the removal of 280e in some cases is going to double triple you know free cash flow and so on the note of the rescheduling of 280e the latest updates what are your thoughts on that do you think do you see um, a little bit more leverage for dispensaries to kind of be able to have some more money to invest um, what do you think I do. I do. Uh, so listen, I know it's a slightly controversial topic. Some people are for it. Some people are against it. Some people think it's the other. And you've noticed it's very extreme, right? People are either it's the best thing ever or it's the worst thing ever. Um, so keep in mind, I'm on the banking side. <laughs> um, from a financing perspective, me as a bank providing lending to a, um, a, a cannabis business, it's huge. Um, again, for a very simple reason, if you take away 280E, the, the the free cash flow so we're talking net profit that the, that the that the business walks away with it, it, it it's night and day again it's double triple in some cases 
So in other words, today, even if I was, you know, the stars align, you've got this financial institution that's willing, able to lend to a cannabis business, does that cannabis business qualify? In many cases, no, <laughs> they just, they just simply don't. Interesting. Um, and so on your end, I'm kind of curious, we were kind of bouncing on this topic previously, but we're back to kind of co compliance. Um, are there some reporting requirements? that you have to fulfill on your end to kind of ensure that the dispensaries or cannabis operators keep their hands clean? Yes. Um, so there's a couple of that. Some of them are due to the, the current discrepancy between federal and state law. That is, to be specific, it's, it's a Schedule One drug, right? So there actually, believe it or not, there, there's a very, there actually is a report that we filed that is specific to cannabis. It's a SAR, Suspicious Activity Report. So you suspect cannabis related activity um so there's a marijuana priority marijuana limited and marijuana termination um and actually the reason that the the because the sars uh exists that's the reason that the um fincen the financial crime enforcement network so fincen thinks that there's something like 800 financial institutions banking cannabis which sounds like a big number, but you know, there's almost 10,000 financial institutions in America, right? Really? Um, yeah. I think of like three or four. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of things to consider, right? What, you know, 800 sounds like a big number, probably much bigger than I think most cannabis industry folks would think. Well, it's, it's believed that the, it's because the SARS is how they track that number. So in other words, you suspect this cannabis related activity, Thus, you file a SAR. You just file every quarter, by the way. So, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. Um, but there is no defini textbook definition for what is or is not a cannabis business. So, in other words, your podcast, I would probably file a SAR on that. Huh. Should I? Who knows? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so that is, that is specific to cannabis. And then because of the cash, a lot of cannabis businesses are cash heavy. There is something called a CTR, a, a cash transaction reporting, um, but that that's not necessarily specific to to, to cannabis. And so, um, I don't know if you get this question a lot. Are, are you a fractional reserve sort of service? Uh, I'm not. No, no. Uh, oh, but again, that's because I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, but again, that's because of, just for anybody listening. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. Yeah, you're, so you're fractional reserve the, is kind of like the, yeah. you know, the idea that banks can kind of invest a huge yeah. chunk of your money, but you don't do the, that. The bank is, yeah. The, uh, uh, basically, every bank is. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Just, just curious about that. Um, sorry, I thought you meant me personally. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, I'm learning about you at the same time, too, and kind of yeah. understanding more about your services as we go. And so, yeah. Um, and back to kind of your relationships and kind of how um, you gain new clients. Uh, do you have any sort of criteria that you use to kind of evaluate whether or not a client is uh, a fit for Peter Sue? Yeah, um, you know, I I like to work through relationships. I like the uh, so we call them COI centers of influence, right? So in other words, uh, if you think about a, can a typical cannabis business, they have a certain number of advisors around them um, that that they almost always have and, and probably should have. Uh -huh. So, for example, attorneys, right? Like your your typical person thinking about a cannabis business, what's their first call? Probably to an attorney, and it probably should be to an attorney. Um, so the way that I usually work is really through the attorneys, through the accountants. Uh, so these like sort of key service providers, um, but that's actually fairly normal in banking, actually working through the centers of influence. So a person setting up a business, they've got an attorney, they've got an accountant, they've got a banker and they all know each other. Um, so for me, that that's a big plus. I, if I know the people around you, um, and I'm comfortable with them. That 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 gives a certain amount of feeling of comfort. Um, um, as given your experience, your expertise, um, as you know, there's a big seed to sale tracking uh, system that we have going on here. What payment processing options, or POS systems, do you think are the best for cannabis businesses to kind of stay compliant? Oh, uh, you know, specific on the POS front, I'm not super uh, uh, conversant on them. I, of course, I'm familiar with them because my clients use them and, and I'm aware yeah. of all the big names, you know, the Dutchies, the Olives of the world. Um, to me, they all seem to, you know, that they, they work fine as long as they're reporting seat to sale tracking to the state, they're compliant. 
Um, of course, I hear uh, my clients complaining about this, that, or the other thing. So that makes me think that there's flaws inherent uh, or weaknesses, I suppose, inherent in some of the uh, the POSs. Um, I, I, from a banking perspective, I, I do not necessarily have a preference. I would say on the payment front, what we're seeing, though, is a lot of instability. Um, so anything that you see that involves like the debit card rails, uh, credit card rails, God forbid, um, none of them are compliant. They're, it just isn't. It's, it's not possible for it to be compliant, actually. Um, so do I, I, if somebody comes to me for a recommendation, I, I, I do have you know, a handful of names that I give out. But I also warn people, like, look, if you're using something that involves a, a card rail, card meaning the, the, the associations, MasterCard, Visa, et cetera, just know that historically most of them have been in, uh, unstable. So if you're using it, um, any day you show up at the dispensary, you know, that day your card might be down, right? Um, on, the, on, the, on the ACH front, those have proven to be more stable. So if you look at, huh. I don't know, Dutch ePay, Arrow Pay, really? um, that, that is uh, ACH based. Um, those traditionally have always stayed, you know, fine. They they worked fine. The problem, obviously, is adoption, meaning consumers just don't want to use them. Apparently, <laughs> so. interesting stuff. So I'd like to kind of change topics a little bit and kind of uh, talk about the access to financial services. So you are a, a what, you're a member of the Asian Cannabis Roundtable, and so you you do a lot of work, kind of helping underrepresented groups uh, get into this industry. And so I'm kind of curious, uh, what, what steps in your mind do you think we could take to kind of improve access uh, to underrepresented groups in the cannabis uh, sector? Oh, I, you know, I, I think those initiatives are, are ongoing and, and they're working well. Uh, if I look at cannabis as, a, as an industry, um, the, let's say New York State, right, where the, the spirit of social equity or you know, equity and justice, social justice, et cetera, is literally written into the laws. Uh, now, wh whether or not that's being properly applied is a different question, right? But the spirit of it is there, right? And you don't, I, don't, I don't see that in other industries necessarily. Um, in the Asian community, I think what we contend with is actually um, maybe even broader than that, there's a, um, there's a real social stigma uh, from a family perspective, uh, and especially the older generation. Um, I mean, th there's a stigma in, 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 I think, for cannabis in general, but in Asian culture, the, the stigma is very strong, very negative. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, a, if you're a Mandarin, if, you, if you're a Chinese speaker, if you speak Mandarin, rather, um, so in English, you have the word drug, which could be medicinal or it could be narcotic, uh -huh. right? So I could be referring to aspirin or I might be referring to Coke, right? Yeah. Um, in Chinese, uh, again, Mandarin specifically, the word that we use, we, we have a word for medicine, we say yao. Um, but the word that we use for narcotics is literally poison. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's interesting. So you would grow up. Think about growing up referring to weed as poison. And yeah. your parents saying like, oh, how could you put that poison? But they're saying poison. <laughs> they're literally saying poison, right? Oh, um, that's so interesting. You know, I, I think some of that has to do with sort of uh, uh, history, right? With the opium wars, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, is that uh, from the, the Asian community contends with a very specific negative stigma uh, above and beyond just like, oh, we need initiatives to get them in. We actually need to like completely change paradigms and views. Um, one, of our, one of my friends and a, a, a Chinese person, uh, he holds cultivation licenses in New York and New Jersey, right? So he's a licensed cultivator in multiple states. He, his deal with his wife and his family was that, so they're aware that he's doing it, but he can't talk about it at home. So they're just, you know, <laughs> they're just closing an eye to it. Interesting. It's kind of crazy. Think about it. This, yeah. is how, this, this guy, this is how he makes a living. He can't talk about it at home. Interesting. What do you think uh, we can do to kind of fix that? Is it kind of like a whole societal, a big issue underlying? Or what, what do you think? Do you change the word? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think it's nothing more than the passage of time. Like if you look oh. at um, 
Uh, yeah, you and I were talking a little bit before this, just based on like age and, and generation, right? Like if I think about the fact that like there's kids growing up right now in California, I say kids, um, that there's a kid who's let's say 18 years old in California for whom almost his entire life or her entire life, cannabis was legal, you know, compared to my view, which for most of my life, cannabis was illegal. You yeah, know? So the stigma, I'm, so I'm sure the perspective of that person, right? That 18 year old in California, um, versus let's say my perspective is probably night and day, right? For them, cannabis is, is, is run of the mill. Like I, I, I you know, my, my grandpa goes, to, goes to the dispensary, you know? Interesting. Um, one more top, one more question on the topic, excuse me. Uh, how can being on the inside, looking out, uh, you're in the industry, you're in the financial sector, what can financial institutions do to support social equity and more underrepresented groups in the cannabis industry? You know, that's a great question. And it's a very difficult one from a, from a financial institution perspective. Um, um, not much, I'll be honest with you. Uh, and there's actually, and, and, and I don't mean to make it sound like, you know, it's not our problem, whatever. The problem is, uh, well, first of all, how do you define social equity, right? But um, years ago, uh, our, our, some, some regulators approached me and they asked me a, a similar question. I said, Peter, how do we get social equity financed? And my retort to them was, I'm like, well, with respect, you're asking me at the bank how to underwrite a loan based on race, gender, um, and this is New York, right? So criminal background. I'm like, now you realize that we're we're actually prohibited from doing that. <laughs> no, it sounds about right because it's discriminatory yeah. in a sense. No, we. I, you're asking me to create a program that actually shows either favorable or unfavorable, like depending how you look at it, right? Um, disparate treatment, we call it, right? So uh, my answer would be, um, it's really, it, it really has to start further up in the regulatory regime. So let, let's say, for example, uh, and again, assuming that the state is willing and the city is, you know, the, the, the bank is willing or something like that. If the city um, or the state or whatever created a program where they were qualifying the applicants. Um, so, so here's an idea that could work, right? Um, let's say kind of like the SBA program, right? The SBA does that where, you know, you, you've got a business, they're willing to backstop the business by X, a certain percentage. It's usually it's like 50 to 70 percent, right? So in other words, I, I extend a loan on the bank. I do a normal business loan, but I know that I can turn around to the SBA and they will backstop a certain percentage of that loan. Um, so to me, to solve the social equity program, you kind of have to do something similar, right? There's, there's a way to qualify that business that takes that out of the bank's hands, right? Because the bank can't say, oh, here's a Chinese owned business. I'm willing to do a loan for you. Now that's, that's strictly prohibited, right? Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if they've if they've qualified into some sort of a program, and that's a state level, city level, federal level, right? Again, like an SBA, and all I have to do is give a sort of sliding scale of like, okay, I'm willing to do X, Y, and Z. Well, that could work. Huh. Very interesting. So we're starting to wrap up here. Um, I just got a, four more questions for you, if that's okay. Um, yeah. First of all, I'm kind of really curious about the Asian Cannabis Roundtable, what you guys do, your part in the industry, uh, what you guys are doing. Oh, sure. Uh, well, so, you know, as the name suggests, <laughs> um, it's, it's a, you know, Asians in Cannabis. Uh, it's actually kind of funny. When I first joined, um, I, I was of the impression that I wouldn't see a lot of Asians in Cannabis. Uh, for the for the reasons that we just discussed, right? I, I was I was of the belief that it's it's viewed negatively. Um, honestly, in my own family, there's a little bit of like, oh, you're. I thought you were in banking, and I'm like, I am in banking. <laughs> you know? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I still am in the banking. You know. Um, however, when we looked around, it was like, wow, actually, there's there's, there's quite a bit of Asians in, in cannabis, and uh, many fairly prominent ones in in prominent positions. You know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, our, our thought is fairly simple, right? There's a little bit of a, hey, let's, let's help change stigma, right? That, that cannabis is bad, right? Like the, this idea that our elders believe that, that cannabis is, is an evil, is a poison. Uh, there's the, you know, social networking. Uh, and then of course there is the, the next generation, the younger kids that want to get into cannabis um, that are looking around saying, hey, are there, Asians in cannabis, 
Um, so our, our mission is kind of threefold, right? Sort of manage, if you, if you want to call it managing up, meaning our elders, uh, managing down, uh, the next generation coming in, uh, wanting to network, wanting to grow in a new industry. And then of course, networking with each other, right? Our peers. You know, that's, that is so awesome. I support you hundred percent. I could, I, I, before this interview, I wouldn't have guessed why you would have the, the Asian cannabis roundtable. It makes so much sense and the need for it makes a lot of sense. And I'm just Thank you for super that. excited for you. I've um, just got some fun final questions for you from here, um, if you're okay answering them. Uh, can you tell me about the first time you used cannabis? Sure. Uh, okay. Um, recognizing that this is probably not a cool answer for your audience, uh, I was I was older. I was uh, I was 21. Uh, actually, it was the night of my 21st birthday. Uh, I was in a fraternity in college. Um, almost everyone smoked, and 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 but you know smokers are cool about that. Like you can, you can hang out. And, and not smoke. So I used to, you know, everybody would puff, puff, pass, pass to me, I would pass it on. But people didn't question the fact that I was simply passing, which again, I think is cool. Uh, as compared to say like alcohol, where like if you're in a bar and you don't have a drink, <laughs> right? Like you, you, I'm sure you've tried it. If you're in a bar and you don't have a drink in your hand, somebody says, oh, no, you're not drinking. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, everything all right, Sam, you good? <laughs> um, so, you know, it was, it was my 21st birthday, you know, somebody passed, I, but instead of simply passing on, I, I puffed. <laughs> did you feel it the first time? A lot of people do. I didn't. You know, I, I didn't really. Um, I felt um, at one point, I guess I started to feel like I was, I, I slowed down. Like, like I was like, oh, my reaction time is, is off. Like something, I'm a little bit off. But I also didn't consume that much. So Yeah. Interesting. Uh, what's your favorite cannabis product these days? Uh, I'm more in the um, um, the consumable, uh, the, the edibles, so the drinks, etc. So drinks is is kind of my thing. Um, that you know, I, I I'm not a smoker, meaning of, of anything, right? Cigarettes, etc. So I'm not huge on sort of uh, uh, putting the smoke into my lungs. Uh, so I prefer like um, anything that's more like liquids uh, or or edibles, etc. Yeah, completely with you there. Um, now one more question for you, Peter. Um, looking into your crystal ball in the next five to ten years, what do you see going on in the cannabis industry? Um, you know, again, I, recognizing that it's a it's a slightly controversial topic, I actually think that Schedule Three, and assuming it happens, the reschedule to three is going to be huge from an innovation perspective. Um, so, when you think about the types of things that we we associate with uh, cannabis from from a from a medical perspective, right? Let's say uh, pain management, sleep management, um, inflammation, right, et cetera, with CBD. Uh, in cannabis, you those those are all multi-billion dollar industries, right? Sleep management is a multi-multi-billion dollar industry. Pain management is a multi-multi-million billion dollar industry. And in cannabis, you have it all in one plant. So, th so let's say is it crazy to think that somebody's going to throw money at you know CBN and and, and prove statistically in in a, in a peer reviewed medical blah 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 that like oh five milligrams for a person of this height this weight is going to be perfect you know et cetera in in other words pass FDA trials and the kind of investment that it takes to pass an FDA trial we're talking a multi year multi million dollar process the kind of process that can't possibly occur today. So to me, my crystal ball says that that's the next phase, right? These specialized, uh, isolated, you know, specific can cannabinoids, and it's going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I, I think that that's the future, right? Because that that's that's where the money is. I love it. Um, and once again, this is Peter Sue. Um, I'll leave his contact information if you want to get in touch with him uh, below. If you have any last words for the audience, Peter? Uh, you know, uh, ch check me out on uh, LinkedIn. I, I'm I'm a fairly regular poster there. Uh, I, I I do tell a lot of lame uh, dad jokes, but I but I appreciate you <laughs> supporting my posts. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Definitely wish you the best, and looking forward to seeing more from you. Thank you so much.